Starship's second flight will introduce a ton of new features to Starship, Super Heavy and Stage Zero. You probably know some of them, hot staging, the new water deluge system, but do you really know them all? Let's dive into some of the most important changes SpaceX has introduced to try and give the second flight more hope than the first. Sponsored by Brilliant. Before diving into these changes, a disclaimer is required. These are changes we have observed over the weeks and months since Starship's first integrated test flight. There's no secret source. Although, to be fair, most of our theories and observations have been confirmed either by Elon Musk slash SpaceX or some other official source like the FAA. So not everything here is speculation. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start with the booster. For Flight 1, SpaceX used Booster 7 and for Flight 2, they'll be using Booster 9. Apart from the name difference, there's a change that I'm sure you will agree is most visible of all, the hot staging ring. This piece of hardware essentially allows the upper stage, the ship, to be able to ignite its engines while still attached to the booster. With its numerous vents, it allows the exhaust from the ship engines to escape through them instead of accumulating between both vehicles, hence why SpaceX calls it a vented interstage. Elon Musk commented that the two main reasons for this change were simplicity and improved performance. I guess there's no argument about it being simpler than the whole inertial staging, where the rocket would have to flip in order to impart the inertia to separate the stages. Here, the ship just has to ignite its engines and then the hooks at the top of the booster would open to release the vehicle. With hot staging, the ship would always be under acceleration until it reaches orbit. Whenever a rocket stops accelerating, gravity starts eating into its performance. So if it never stops thrusting, like Elon said, then the rocket has more performance left and can carry more payload into orbit. This hot staging ring sports a shield that performs two functions. It diverts the exhaust outwards and also shields the top of the booster from being damaged by it. In one of the pictures SpaceX shared, we can see the heavy structural reinforcement needed under this shield to take on the force of the exhaust. A common question that we receive about this piece of hardware is, how is it installed on the booster? And the answer is rather simple. It just uses the same hardware that was already used to attach the ship and booster together. On the aft end, the hot staging ring contains the holes for the guiding pins and hooks from the booster to attach to it. Meanwhile, on the forward end, it has the pins and hooks needed to be attached to the ship. If we move just slightly downwards from this ring on the booster, we can see what appears to be the addition of new vents. We've seen these vents in action on Booster 9 and it also looks like Booster 10 has them as well. These vents were initially thought to be related to the hot staging ring, perhaps to provide a way to regulate the pressure in the space between the booster forward dome and the hot staging ring. However, the fact that it is present on Booster 10, which doesn't have a hot staging ring and yet it still vents, is a really strong hint that it is definitely not related at all with hot staging. For now, the mystery of these new vents remains unknown, but given the location, these could be new vents for the top of the booster's methane tank or even complete replacements for the ones that already exist. And you might wonder, why should we even care about some vents on the booster? The reason is that these vents will be used as the booster's attitude thrusters after stage separation. A change on these is, essentially, a change on how the whole attitude control of the booster works. Another less technical reason might also be to know what scared you while you were watching Starbase Live and the booster decided to start venting very loudly and startle you in the middle of the night. Totally not a personal note from Alex who wrote this script. So we've already covered the new hot staging ring and the vents right underneath it. The next major set of changes are located right on the engine section and some of these are really cool. Yes, pun intended, you'll see in a moment. One of the major changes to the booster engines will be the addition of Electric Thrust Vector Control, or TVC. This is basically what allows the booster to move the inner 13 engines and steer the rocket. For Booster 7, this TVC system was hydraulically actuated, meaning that it needed what are called hydraulic power units, or HPUs, to drive the hydraulics on the booster. 
With the electric TVC, the need for this disappears, so these HPUs have been removed from the booster, which has greatly simplified the way that it moves its engines. There's another change on the booster introduced from the removal of the hydraulic power units, and that is the location of the Starlink antennas on the vehicle. On Booster 7, these antennas were located on the top part of the HPU aero covers. However, with no HPUs on Booster 9, these antennas have now been moved to the top of the aerodynamic chines of the vehicle. Another important upgrade for Booster 9 is the upgraded shields between engines compared to Booster 7. According to Elon, this shielding was mostly a retrofit for Booster 7, while for Booster 9 it is much more robust and should contain rowdy raptors from damaging neighbouring engines. We saw on Starship's first flight how a few engines ended up exploding during ascent and ripping off this shielding. So if it were to happen on Booster 9, which we hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, then it will likely hold in place and avoid damaging other engines. It is definitely important for SpaceX to avoid the mistakes made during the first flight, and that's mostly what the next two booster changes are all about. But before that, here's Sawyer with a word from our sponsor. All right, you want 20 bucks on September 25th. You want over or under on staging? I don't know what a parlay is, but here you go. Okay, first off, yes, I do actually speak like that sometimes off camera. Second, is there a way to use the data from Flight 1 to make some of these predictions for Flight 2? You can find out yourself using a great course on Brilliant.org, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant.org is continually adding new math, science, and computer-related lessons to their library of thousands that make learning easy. As we talk about different Starship variants, there's a whole course on variation. That includes looking at past data to try and predict the best outcome for the future, and even using data you already have, like the length of a penguin's wings, to see if they're going to be fat. To get started with a 30-day free trial, visit brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or click the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now I'm betting we have more information on the differences between the vehicles from Flight 1 and Flight 2. Let's get back to it. Bring on the engine purge. To talk about this system, we need to go back to Booster 7 and its aerodynamic chines. You might notice that for that vehicle, there were two big ones and two thinner chines on the other side. The big ones store the composite overwrapped pressure vessels, or COPVs, that hold the high pressure gases needed for reigniting the inner 13 engines on the booster for its return. The smaller ones didn't contain COPVs, but rather two really long and thin tubes that held what is now believed to be carbon dioxide, or CO2, to act as a fire suppression system on the booster. This CO2 would be injected in between the engines during flight to avoid the potential for fires in the engine bay. However, we've recently learned from SpaceX that during the first flight, quote, the vehicle sustained fires from leaking propellant in the aft end of the super heavy booster, which eventually severed connection with the vehicle's primary flight computer. This led to a loss of communications to the majority of the booster engines and ultimately control of the vehicle. So it seems like the system that was in place to avoid a fire in the engine bay did, in fact, not avoid a massive fire in the engine bay at all. So what was SpaceX's solution to that? A massive upgrade. According to the list of 63 corrective actions that SpaceX identified, this system had seen a 15-fold increase in the fire suppression capacity. The interesting thing is that we already suspected this way before it was made official. The first sign that this was happening occurred when Booster 9's smaller chines were removed and several weeks later, the vehicle was seen with now wider and much larger cylindrical tanks attached where these chines were previously located. With the larger tanks now inside of these chines, all four of them are now the same size. In addition to this, a new set of vents was seen on the aft end of the booster. These are 18 vents that essentially help the CO2 to escape out of the cavities created by the booster engine shields, into which it is injected to avoid the fires in the first place. And this is the really cool part, because we've seen this system in action already, and these vents being used during engine testing, and it's amazing. When we're not in engine testing, this purging system is definitely very visible as a cloud of white gas coming out of the vents. It is thought that these vents are only for the outer 20 engines, and yes, 18 vents and 20 engines, we're not fully sure why this is that way, but perhaps some of the engine cavities are connected to other vents making it all even. That would mean that the inner 13 engines would have to vent basically overboard from the bottom. However, when the engines are being tested, we can see this system enter into action. During Booster 9's static fire tests, we could see these starting up just at the same time 
as the engine, so it definitely looks like we're going to see this system activated at engine ignition and continue to work during flight. As I mentioned before, it is crucial for SpaceX to not repeat the same big mistakes that's happened during SpaceX's first flight, and another one of these had to do with the vehicle's flight termination system, or FTS. This system is very self-explanatory. It terminates the flight once triggered. There's multiple ways of doing this. Some rockets just terminate the thrust and let the rocket fall back down in one piece, and other rockets have an explosive system. That's how it's done on Starship. Unlike on most traditional rockets, Starship's FTS is autonomous, and that means there's no one on the ground with a big red button waiting for the rocket to veer off course to blow it up. This is also the case for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, where it is normally called the Autonomous Flight Termination System, or AFTS. On Booster 7, this system consisted of a set of charges located right on the common bulkhead that separated the methane and oxygen tanks of the vehicle. This amount of charges was thought to be enough to break this bulkhead apart, mix both propellants, and subsequently create an explosion that would terminate the flight. However, as was demonstrated during the first flight, this did not happen. The charges instead just blew a hole in the side of the tank, and that was pretty much all of it. The rocket eventually broke off due to aerodynamic forces as it was falling down. So what was SpaceX's solution? Just add more charges. <laughs> That's it. Booster 9 sports an extra set of charges a bit higher from where the previous charges were located. Formed a test on a subscale test article at Massey's to confirm the effectiveness of these new charges. We all can agree that we don't want this system to be activated on the next flight, but it is important to make sure that, if it is ever needed, then it works and it does terminate the flight as intended. And with that, we've covered pretty much all of the major booster changes, so let's go over to the ship. We've just talked about the addition of more flight termination system charges on the booster, and of course, the ship is no different. Ship 25, just like Booster 9, also sports additional charges for its FTS that are located also a bit higher on the vehicle from where the previous charges were located. Overall, Ship 25 represents a similar design to Ship 24, so there's really only one other major change on this vehicle. Shortly before rolling out to the launch pad for what we hope its final time before launch, a series of new openings were spotted on the aft section of this vehicle. In particular, these appear to be located right above where the engine shielding resides. If you remember, not only the booster engines are shielded, but also the ship engines sport their own shielding as well. This shielding creates a false ceiling in between the Raptors and the aft dome of the ship. This false ceiling leaves a space that, just like on the booster, could also get filled with leaking propellant and be set on fire accidentally. While not confirmed, it could be that this set of openings are there to precisely let that space to be vented out and avoid fires. Along with these openings, there is also a new pair of pipes coming out of the engine section. As you can see, these are not the only pipes coming down from the aft section of the ship, but those other pipes were already there for Ship 24. These other pipes help vent overboard the products of the engine chill system. This system basically ensures that the engine pumps are properly cooled down before flowing extremely cold liquid oxygen and liquid methane through them. These do not have an extension present on the booster, so it could be that whatever comes out of them only comes out when the ship is already flying by itself. Sadly, we haven't had any test of the full stack yet to confirm all of this, so it remains conjecture. There is not a lot of data to know what these might be for, but if you do have a theory, maybe leave it in the comments and we'll see who gets it right. It's not only the vehicles that are changing from Flight 1 to Flight 2. The launch pad has also seen major upgrades in preparation for Starship's next flight. The most important upgrade to the launch pad for Flight 2 without discussion is the addition of a flame deflector underneath the orbital launch mount. If you remember, during the first flight, the engines essentially dug a crater underneath it, tearing apart the concrete and sending sand and slabs of concrete dozens of meters above the ground and about half a kilometer away. This new system not only protects the underneath of the pad from the fury of the Raptors, but it is also over a much stronger foundation that should avoid the engines from digging into the ground. We overviewed this flame deflector system in detail in a recent video where we talked about the uniqueness of it and how it compared to traditional systems. You should check it out. 
However, according to Elon, the problem during the first flight was not only the fact that the Raptors were able to dig into the concrete, but also the duration that they were firing before the rocket lifted off. This was not unplanned or anything like it, but rather expected. He explained, in fact, that this was all done in order to allow the engines to start up slower and more gently before committing to liftoff. But now, with data from the first launch already gathered, the plan is to start up the engines much faster at liftoff, and this involved changes to the launch pad for a faster spin-up of the Outer 20 engines. For those who don't know, these Outer 20 engines each are connected to a quick disconnect umbilical located directly on the orbital launch mount. This umbilical provides nitrogen for pre-launch purges of the engine, but more importantly, it provides high-pressure helium to spin up the pumps and high-pressure gaseous oxygen and gaseous methane for the torch igniters on the engine pre-burners. This new and faster system was tested on Booster 9's first static fire on August 6th. However, several engines shut down prematurely during this test. Booster 9 was subsequently removed from the pad and sent back to the production site. Workers promptly started working on the orbital launch mount and, in particular, its Raptor quick disconnect umbilicals. These were later tested several times. It's not proof of anything, that much we can admit, but it's definitely quite the smoking gun that these had to be tested so much after the not-so-successful static fire test. Thankfully, Booster 9 came back to the pad and finally completed its engine testing with a 33-turn-31 engine static fire test on August 25th. While those two are some of the major changes to the launch pad, a few adjustments had to be made due to some of the upgrades we've seen on the booster. For example, with a hot staging ring now sitting on top of the booster, that means the ship is a ring higher than before. This meant having to change the height of the ship quick disconnect umbilical, and it appears that SpaceX took this opportunity to add a protective cover to this umbilical that closes and covers its openings during liftoff. We've already seen this in action during the retraction tests of this umbilical, and you can see the cover door closing right after the umbilical detaches from the vehicle. Another of these little changes has to do with the removal of the HPUs on the booster. Not only were the Starlink antennas located on the HPU aero covers, but also the hole used for the guiding pins present on the booster transport stand and the orbital launch mount. With the removal of the HPUs, these holes are now located directly on the airframe of the booster, so that meant extending the pins on the orbital launch mount in order to reach in and attach to this hole. As you can see, there's quite a decent amount of changes coming up for the next flight, and yet SpaceX is already introducing changes on the vehicles and launch pad for the following flights. For example, we've seen the addition of subcoolers and cryogenic pumps on the orbital tank farm that should help reduce their propellant load times for later flights. On the booster side of things, Booster 10 is introducing a new common dome, which is flatter than previous common domes. This should allow for more propellant to be loaded in both tanks of the vehicle. Ship 26 will already introduce the new electric TVC system, and that will be present on all of the subsequent ships as well. Some of the vents that we see now on Ship 25 have been deleted from others, and some have been added. We could already see new hardware on Ship 28's nose code, which we haven't seen before. There are a bunch of changes that you can keep your eyes out for on launch day, or really any day leading up to launch with Starbase Live. There are, as you might expect, many smaller changes as well, but this list is a good summary of the most important upgrades. Elon recently cited thousands of upgrades on Twitter, so there are for sure lots of other changes we can't even see. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to get your 30-day free trial or 20% off an annual premium subscription by going to brilliant.org forward slash NASA spaceflight or just by going to the link in the description. Thanks for watching and goodbye.